hello there. Welcome to another parable in our mini-series, Jesus and His Explosive Parables. If you have been following along with us, we just select a parable and then we take as many episodes as necessary to unpack it. And the parable that we're going to begin looking at in this episode is known as the parable of the rich fool. And as we have been talking in this series, there are no parables recorded in the gospel or the biography of John, only in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But this particular parable only shows up in Luke chapter 12. And as is the case with nearly all the parables, there is some kind of context or some kind of situation that is initiated that eventually leads into the telling of a story or a parable. So here is that particular context recorded here in Luke 12, beginning in verse 13. It says, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, we're going to get into the context of this situation and the rest of the parable in the episodes that are to come. But for now, just simply understand that what's unfolding here is that a patriarch of a family, the father of a family, has died. According to the Old Testament, according to Mosaic law, the eldest son gets a double portion, and then the rest of the inheritance is divided among the rest of the brothers. And so we have a family dispute going on here and a brother who feels like he is being wronged by another brother shows up and says, Jesus, my brother is in the wrong. I am in the right. I want you to rule on my behalf. And so Jesus as a teacher or behind this as a rabbi he would have been sought out by people who had some kind of dispute because rabbis were masters at applying the laws of the scriptures. And so he has come to Jesus and he is saying, I want you to step in and I want you to speak into this family dispute. Jesus' response is, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And Jesus using this word man here uh, is strained. It's like Jesus is frustrated by the situation and Jesus sees through what is going on. The dude has showed up to say, hey, I need you to rule in my favor. And Jesus is like, actually, there is a much bigger issue we need to deal with. And so then notice what Jesus does next. It says, then Jesus said to them, not to the brother, but to the entire crowd with the brothers standing there, Jesus gives a principle. He gives the point that he wants them to get. And Jesus says this, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, this is Jesus' point but now he is going to give the parable a story to confirm his point or to even make it more poignant. And Jesus tells this story, verse 16 and following. And Jesus told them this parable. The land of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And in one of the coming episodes, we'll talk about why he is saying to my soul. What's the significance of that? I'm sure many of you just picked up on. That's got to be significant in some way. So he says, all right, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Now, here's what's utterly fascinating about this parable. It's the only parable we have in the Bible where God is an active character within it. 
like explicitly. In other parables, God is implicitly there as one of the characters, but this is the only parable that Jesus tells where he said God is a character in the story and this is what God did. And what does God do? He says, you fool! This very night your soul be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And then Jesus concludes by saying this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. So again, we'll unpack this in future episodes, um, but just notice how Jesus concludes this. He says, whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God, this is what's going to happen. This is how it is. And again, Jesus gave us this story by already giving us the purpose of it up front when he said, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like in many ways we could stop recording or I could just stop talking And we could just keep these words of Jesus up on the screen and just sit for some time and just let them wash over us. And just allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives where we aren't living this out. Or we do think that much of our life is around possessions. Um, And I'm not going to turn off the camera or the recording right now because I want to show you a couple of other things. But friends, this is the essence of the parable. Jesus gave us the point up front. This is the point of this particular episode. But what I want to do now is I just want to show you where this story is occurring in Luke and particularly here in chapter 12. Now, just understand, we didn't get chapters as we know them until nearly a thousand years after the Bible was written, okay? So Luke didn't organize these by chapters, but in this chapter as a whole, it's really fascinating to me where this particular story shows up. So in Luke 12, if you look at the first 11 verses, you will see a discussion Jesus is having with his audience around fear. And then we come to this story, verses 13 to 21, which is about a guy who is going after uh, possessions, achievements. In a way, he's saying, listen, I now have what I need. All is well. It's really about an issue of security. And then immediately after this, if you're opening up or you have, you know, Luke 12 open in front of you, you will see that verses 22 through 30 are Jesus addressing worry and anxiety. You know, the famous, you know, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. Look at the flowers of the field. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon, all the splendor was, you know, wasn't dressed like one of these. You know, all of that famous language. That's here recorded in Luke 12. And so if you just look at these three words and these three topics, fear, security, or the desire to have security, and anxiety, how much do these things govern your life? Uh, How much does fear factor into your daily existence? Um, Worried about this, um, concerned that you're not going to have that, right? You feel a a lack of security. And so what do you do to try to gain that security, right? What, how much does that govern what you do? And when you aren't achieving, when you aren't accomplishing, when you're not getting that, you know, security, how much worry and anxiety do you experience? I don't think it's just happenstance that these issues are all being wrapped up together because they are actually intertwined with one another. And this story that Jesus gives is in the midst of this longer conversation where he goes, listen, this is all about a sense of of inappropriate fear. You know, several episodes ago, we talked about fear, like right before we got into this parable series, we talked about what's a good, healthy understanding of fear from a biblical perspective. Jesus is addressing like that negative kind of fear. 
right? And that sense of not having or always wanting to have more so that we feel more secure and just the worry and anxiety that comes along when we're grasping and seeking and trying to attain things. And what's so um, compelling to me is that after Jesus has talked about fear and then a sense of how we desire security, but we put it in the wrong things, we put it in our wealth, we put it in our status, we put it into our accomplishments, we stick it into you know, our achievements, and then we have this overwhelming sense of worry and anxiety. Jesus in verse 31 is recorded. He says, but seek his kingdom. Uh, Matthew's version of this is, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well and recorded here in Luke. But seek first his kingdom, or excuse me, but seek his kingdom. And all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus is like, when you are focused on the things of God, and Jesus is obviously the representation of God. He is God. And he's saying, this is what the kingdom is like. When you live this out, these other things are not going to shackle you anymore. The fear, the sense of insecurity, the the anxiety and the worry. Jesus goes, no, 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 no. Like, seek first my way what I am teaching you to do, what I am challenging you to walk out, and everything else will fall in line. Those things that kept you up at night, that you were worried about, that you were concerned about, that you know, brought an enormous amount of fear that you had to try to seek security around, like those things will take care of themselves and you're going to be so much better off if you can focus in on what I am calling you to do. And friends, in this particular episode and with this particular parable, Jesus tells us what he is saying. He's saying, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And the question I believe we're being challenged with here is, what do we really believe about the possessions we have and want? Like, how do we think about what we currently possess? Uh, And what's more about what we long for, what we desire, what we want? How do we think about these things? What do we really believe that they're going to do? Are they going to simply serve a purpose for everyday life? Or in some way, are they going to fulfill us in a way that we're hoping they will But in actuality, they won't and they don't. You know, in reading Klein Snodgrass and a number of other authors who are, by the way, linked uh, underneath this video at walkingthetext.com, is that Klein Snodgrass in his book Stories with Intent, in looking at this particular parable, he just says this. It's so powerful and it's so penetrating. He says, parables like this strike a tender nerve especially when we admit to ourselves, as we must, that we want to be like the rich fool. We want to say to ourselves, I have many good things or a lot of money laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and celebrate. Like he says, that's what we want. Like if we just really kind of strip away all the pretenses, we want to have this sense of, okay, I'm good. I got everything I need. I got everything in the bank that I need. I got all the possessions I want. Like I can just, you know, chill because I have finally obtained that security. And the fool who thought he wasn't a fool in this story thought that that was the point. That would bring a sense of security. That would alleviate the fear. That would alleviate the anxiety. And God goes, you think you're rich. You're actually bankrupt because you think possessions are going to do something for you that only I can do for you. And as long as you are caught in the allurement of what you have and what you want to possess, you are in a lot of trouble. And Klein highlights this. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, the message of this parable is as antithetical to our thinking as any Jesus told. I know of no more difficult topic to apply personally or to the lives of modern Western Christians. Friends, I I identify with this. You know, oftentimes when I'm putting together these teachings, it's not that I just kind of wake up one morning and go, oh, what would I like to film today? It's like I'm wrestling with these things for days, sometimes weeks, and many times months. And I know that this has hit a chord with me. 
You know, for those of you who may be watching or listening to this on the release week, uh, next week is Thanksgiving. Right, it's a day where we come together. We, you know, amp up our gratitude and our thankfulness, you know, to God for what we have, for our friends, for our family. Um, but y'all know what's coming on the next screen because you've been inundated with Black Friday deals. You know, it seems like it's been since August, right? It's like yes, we can be thankful for a day, but now we need to move into Black Friday where we can acquire more at a cheaper price and fulfill the things that we're hoping these things fulfill. And then after Black Friday, um, if you haven't shopped local, then you need to do Small Business Saturday. You know, support the local establishments. You know, if you spend all your time on, you know, Amazon or something else, well, get local. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, we all know what's coming on Monday, but those deals start on Sunday in order to start talking about Cyber Monday. And then, my goodness, a Cyber Monday deal can't end at midnight. It's got to go into Tuesday, but Tuesday already reserved for what? Right, yeah, Giving Tuesday. You know, it's almost like Giving Tuesday came about because everybody was feeling so guilty about everything they bought on these other days. Now, I, I recognize that uh, this is a little bit of an interesting conversation to have when we're a nonprofit organization, crowdfunded, that actually relies a lot on Giving Tuesday. But here's the thing that I always say is that I don't ever personally want to give or I don't want anybody to give out of a sense of guilt or obligation. Right? I want people to give out of a sense that says, man, I'm grateful for what I have and you know, maybe this organization or this organization is impacting me in some way and I believe that they're having impact you know, with people around the world and I want to be part of it and I believe God's calling me to give to that. Like Those are the reasons why you give to something, not just because you spent all this money on Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Sunday, Cyber Monday, and you go, well, now I need to be generous you know, to other people. But friends, this is the world that we live in. This is the world that we're couched in. And when it comes to this parable and just recognizing our own context, like the point of the parable isn't hard to understand. Uh, the problem, however, is that we live as if the point isn't true. I think that for many of us, we could just summarize it this way by saying, we're possessed by our possessions. And maybe for some of us, we can articulate that. We're willing to articulate that. Um, I think for many of us, we don't even recognize how much we're being possessed by possessions, by what we have and what we long to have. And I believe Jesus is going right after that. And so as we tie up this particular episode, here's what I just want to challenge you and I'm challenging myself with is what do we believe about our possessions and where might we be possessed by our possessions and how may God be speaking a new word into us, a word of challenge or a word of encouragement uh, to get off that path that we're on or maybe have been on and get on to a new path a path that he would want us to be walking, that where we truly listen to the words of Jesus, that we watch out, that we're on our guard against all kinds of greed because one's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. So friends, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We're going to go deeper into this in the weeks to come. But for now, may we embrace these words of Jesus and may we truly walk out this text in our lives.